Good afternoon and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for the Johns Hopkins School of Education virtual information session. This afternoon's session will focus on program and admissions information for our master's and graduate certificate degrees in DAYLIT, which stands as our acronym for Digital Age Learning and Educational Technology. We are excited to share with you um, some of the features and exciting opportunities that these dynamic programs have to offer. My name is Elizabeth Woodward and I serve as the Director of Admissions here at the School of Education. And I'm joined this afternoon by my colleague in admissions who I will ask to introduce herself. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. My name is Sion John, Assistant Director of Admissions here at the Johns Hopkins School of Education. Welcome everyone. Thanks, Sion. And we are also, last but not least, joined by our keynote presenter, Dr. James Diamond, who serves as the faculty lead for Daylight Programs. Hi, everyone. Good to be here. Thanks, Liz. Okay, if we can move. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to cover a few logistical items for today's presentation. First, today's webinar is being recorded. The admissions office will make the recorded presentation available on our website after the event, should you wish to review it again, or maybe even share it with a friend or colleague who also may be interested in our daylit programs. Please take a moment to make certain that your microphone is on mute during uh, the presentation and that your camera is turned off. At the conclusion of the event, we will invite you to ask questions of our presenter and the admissions team using our chat function in Zoom. My colleague Sian and I will read and answer each question listed in the chat aloud and help answer those uh, with um, certainly with Dr. Diamond's help. So, um, okay, um, here is a quick view of today's agenda and the information we'll be covering. We're going to do a very brief overview of Johns Hopkins University and the School of Education. Um, the overview of the featured program for Daylit, our master's degree, our admissions requirements, financial aid, scholarship. And then, as I mentioned earlier, our Q&A. So to start us off, um, we'll talk a little bit about Johns Hopkins as a whole enrolls more than 24,000 part-time and full-time students across nine academic divisions and three campuses, our flagship campus, of course, being in Baltimore City and Maryland, as well as classroom sites located throughout the Baltimore DC region. Established in 2007, the Johns Hopkins School of Education is the youngest of the nine divisions and has quickly taken its place as a national leader in educational reform and innovation. Grounded in the Johns Hopkins tradition of research and evidence-based practice, the School of Education consistently ranks among the top graduate schools of education in the nation by US News and World Report. Over the past 13 years, the School of Education has grown its mission to train teachers, school leaders, counselors, and practitioners to meet the contemporary challenges of teaching and learning. Today, the school has 112 full-time faculty, 2,437 enrolled students across 30 degree programs spanning from initial teacher preparation, counseling, interdisciplinary, and advanced studies and doctoral programs, as well as our daylit programs, which are the focus of today's session. The purpose of today's event is really twofold. First, to give you the overview of the curriculum, learning opportunities, outcomes, and an overview of the admissions process. Second is to connect you to our faculty who can share with you what the learning experience focuses on as well as current research trends and how uh, students are applying what they're learning in their curriculum to the field in their current professions. This session is a chance for you to engage and ask questions, and we hope you find today's session useful and look forward to receiving your completed application for one of our upcoming terms. This, uh, um, the daylit programs admit students in spring, summer, or fall. We strongly encourage anyone who is interested to start the application process, process as soon as possible, and our admissions office and representatives here today are more than happy to assist you in navigating that process and answering any questions you may have after today's presentation. Okay, um, I would now like to introduce our presenter, Dr. Jim Diamond. Um, Dr. Diamond is a researcher in the field of digital media and learning. 
focused primarily on the use of educational gains to enrich K through 12 learning and teaching for students and teachers. He has extensive experience in educational research, design and evaluation. And his areas of interest include history, social studies, civics education, STEM education, computational thinking and uh, disciplinary literacy. His research has been funded by the National Science Foundation, MacArthur Foundation and Gates Foundation, just to name a few. And Dr. Diamond is a graduate um, of his degrees from Boston University and his PhD from New York University. So without further delay, Dr. Diamond, if you'd like to take it away. Okay, thank you very much, Liz. Uh, Tian, thank you as well. Um, I'm gonna put my camera on so you, you all can see me as I, as I talk. Um, it's very nice to, hear, uh, to have you here this afternoon. Thank you for joining us as always. I'm very excited to talk about this program. I'm very excited to know that there are prospective students uh, and educators in the world who are thinking about and perhaps as passionate about the field of educational technology um, as I am. Um, and I love the opportunity to brag about my program um, with, with you all. Um, so we're gonna go through some slides uh, to give you the 10,000 foot overview of the program. Uh, that will probably happen relatively quickly and we'll leave uh, as much time as possible um, at the end of the at the end of the webinar uh, for your questions. Let me say in advance that um, we don't have a current student um, or an alum with us today. Um, I we do try to have them join us from time to time. We just we just don't today. Um, but if there are those of you, particularly at the end of the webinar, who feel like you would benefit. And I certainly feel like you would benefit uh, from, from talking with a current student or a graduate of the program, um, then by all means, please get in contact, uh, in touch with me afterwards. You'll, you'll have my contact information um, and I'll arrange to, to put you in touch um, with someone. So let, let me say a quick word before we start. Um, I think this is a pretty remarkable time to be in the field of educational technology. I, I've always thought that, that's, that's why I wound up here. Um, but on the heels of a pandemic, um, on the heels of a resurgent pandemic perhaps, um, when we saw the world just about migrate uh, online pretty quickly, um, and we are seeing the world make some decisions again pretty quickly about uh, where we think students um, from early childhood all the way on through adult education um, should be uh, in the fall. Should we be convening together? Should we continue to meet virtually as you and I are now? Uh, should we do so in, uh, in some blended environment? Um, I think that uh, as you all know, uh, districts and families and administrators and leaders uh, all over the place are, are making these decisions right now. And as many of you probably know, um, it's been a remarkably challenging time. It's been a remarkably innovative time. Uh, we've learned something about um, mass online education. I think some of it's been encouraging. Some of it's been very discouraging. Uh, we've seen existing in inequities sort of blown up uh, even more extensively, that extensively than what existed before, or or if we weren't aware of those equity inequities, uh, I think we are likely and hopefully more aware of them now. Uh, and I will say that a program like mine, the faculty and the students, uh, we are essentially people who are interested in studying and thinking about and uh, and and being critical evaluators of and critical producers of. Uh, technologies, tools to use in traditional face-to-face, -face, virtual, uh, blended or hybrid learning in environments, um, and doing so with a very strong focus on practice, right? So Dalit is a program that is probably first and foremost focused on pedagogy. So how do educators from uh, early elementary school all the way on through the adult education space learn to apply uh, and in some cases design these technologies such that they support um, the development and growth and learning needs of, of all their learners. So the faculty in our program are certainly teaching in those areas. We are conducting research in those areas. The educators in our program, the graduate students, 
uh, are currently doing that professionally um, and thinking about how to continue to, to build and improve their practices um, as, as they study with us. So the last thing I'll say is that um, when you come to a program like this, you're constantly going to be asking yourselves some very important questions, right? Um, who benefits from the use of these technologies, of these educational technologies? Who does not and why not? And what are the agendas behind the development of these technologies? Where does the money come from to develop these technologies? Who makes decisions about how these technologies are implemented from the home to the classroom, all the way, uh, all the way on up? Um, and these are, these are important questions that you will keep revisiting um, as you continue to build your practice, as you continue to explore theory in instructional design, as you continue to explore theory uh, in the learning sciences, and as you deepen your understanding of how human beings learn um, with tools in constructed environments, right? That's a big part of, of what we are after here is, is ever deepening um, our questions and curiosity about the design of, of these learning environments. Um, and so again, I, I'm excited uh, to know that people are thinking about joining us in asking those questions and thinking about um, pushing on those pursuits. Okay, with that, so let's, let's start our slides, please. Or next slide, I should say. Okay, so uh, Dalit is a fully online program. Um, we do not meet face to face until you graduate, um, or hopefully we meet face to face when you graduate, but everything in advance of that uh, is conducted online. We are uh, primarily a master's of science in education degree. So as you see, 36 credits, 12 courses, which includes uh, student capstone experiences or sort of the traditional end products of a master's degree. We also have a graduate certificate uh, in leadership and technology education uh, program, which is a smaller program. You can see that's 15 credit or, or five classes. Most of our students are done between two and three years on the, on the lower end of that. Uh, for the professional certificate, typically students are, are done um, in a year or so. I'll talk a little bit more uh, as we go about what a, uh, a typical program looks like. As you can see, uh, we currently enroll students uh, in, in all three terms. Next slide, please. So who is this program for? Well, I told you a little bit about who I, I, I think it's for. Um, and so to, to get more specific about it, who are our students? Well, most of them are in K-12 education, um, either as, as classroom teachers or as administrators. And then, and that's a good 70% of our student body. Uh, and then this other 30% is in the adult education space, right? So you can see organizational leaders, consultants, people in higher ed, people in publishing, people in government um, are, all come through uh, the program uh, as students. And increasingly that last bullet point, uh, people who are interested in, in online education. Okay, next slide, please. These numbers change a little bit uh, as, as you can imagine, uh, but take on average, there's about 70 students uh, in, in the program, the great, the vast majority of whom are, are part-time students, meaning they're, they are typically taking two semesters a term. Uh, just about all of our students are full-time working professionals. Um, so they are um, doing their jobs during the day and then in evenings and, and weekends, um, they, are, they are doing their graduate, uh, graduate work online. This is typically the ratio of uh, females to males. And the, the average age is uh, usually mid thirties. Next slide, please. Here too, uh, this is a, a sort of uh, forever changing, right? But this map uh, gives you something of a, a representation of where our students are. So uh, across time zones in the continental United States, uh, any number of countries uh, around the world, this, these are just a few that, that have been uh, selected. So geographically, it's a pretty, pretty remarkably diverse um, uh, st student body, uh, and you really will have opportunities to meet uh, students from, from all over the world in this program. Next slide, please. 
it's as an online program, it's run on a online learning management system. Currently that's Blackboard, um, which Blackboard is essentially your virtual, your virtual space, right? All of your classes are conducted online via, via Blackboard. Um, in terms of format, um, there is a combination of asynchronous, so meaning on your own time in your own place and synchronous meaning coming together, uh, all of us at the same time, uh, virtually face-to-face, -face, right? So via something uh, like, like a Zoom session. Uh, format wise, it will vary from class to class, but you will invariably see some um, combination of uh, lectures, some live, some recorded, uh, interactive activities, um, either uh, within uh, the learning management system or using any number of other apps. Uh, discussions, again, some real time and some live. Uh, others um, conducted via traditional discussion boards or apps like Flipgrid or Microsoft Teams or any number of other tools. Um, and, and as well, um, uh, a whole host of tools that students and, and faculty use uh, to, to collaborate with, with, with one another again, synchronously and asynchronously. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, so these are these are uh, uh, just a, a, a few examples of our courses. Um, if if you have the student handbook, uh, you'll be able to see all of the courses with some brief explanations. You can also see uh, the full program of courses, um, the course titles in any event um, on the on the program's external facing page. Um, so this just gives you uh, sort of a, a flavor via the via the course titles. So technology and the science of learning is our introductory seminar. All of our students take it in their first term. Uh, it is a fairly traditional graduate seminar. It's, it's very heavy in reading. Um, you'll do a lot of, uh, you'll do a lot of reading um, in foundational texts and the learning sciences, and you'll also do a lot of reading um, in empirical literature to start to make connections between theory uh, and what people in, in the broad field of, of educational technology um, are studying in order to think to identify things like best practices for uh, for use in educational technologies. Um, a number of other courses here. Some of these are electives. Some of them uh, are are required courses. Again, you, you'll be able to read descriptions of these online. Next slide, please. Uh, so our faculty uh, come from higher education. Uh, they come from think tanks. Uh, there are adjuncts who are administrators in, uh, in K-12. We have principals, assistant principals. Uh, we have professional instructional designers. Uh, we do have people uh, who, uh, who work in, in various levels um, of government. Uh, we do have some adjunct uh, instructors who come out of um, the computer science space, the game development space. Uh, so it's a, it is a very, very diverse, um, in terms of professional backgrounds, uh, faculty body. Next slide, please. So I talked a little bit about where our, our, our students typically are when they come in the door. And again, most of them are in the K-12 space. Um, our students don't always stay there. Some percentage of them do, right? Uh, a large percentage of them do. Some uh, look to move into district or state level positions. Some of them leave uh, the classroom and education altogether and go into private industry. Some of them go on uh, to work for themselves um, as entrepreneurs or uh, working for, for startup, comp for ed tech startup companies. Um, but, but as you can see that, you know, ed educational technology is, is just such a broad field, this, this broad field of instructional technology. Uh, so you have instructional designers, you have instructional technologists, you have people who go into consulting, um, you have faculty in higher ed, uh, you have people who go into media production, media development. Uh, not often, but occasionally we have people who go into game design, which is not necessarily the same as development, but um, sometimes people who actually do go on to, to go into the development, of, uh, development side of things as well. Next slide, please. 
So some of the advantages of our program, it's fully online, uh, which for people who are not prepared to relocate geographically, uh, which for people who are full-time working professionals um, is an enormous advantage, right? Especially um, from an institution such as Hopkins, uh, which has such an incredible level of expertise um, and, and such a committed group of people to have access to them from all over the world uh, is, is a pretty remarkable advantage. Um, again, educational technology is a very broad field. You have a faculty um, that has just a, a, a collectively an enormous amount of professional experience, uh, an enormous amount of research and development experience. Um, and they are able to not only teach you, they are able to advise you, they are able to help you expand your networks and think about how the work that you're doing here might apply in other places, how to connect what you're currently doing um, to other professional settings. Um, and lastly, it is very true, this program has its roots in K-12 education, technology integration, and its roots remain firmly in K-12 technology integration. So it is a program that is a especially strong uh, for, for K-12 educators, given how much experience and expertise we have in that space. Next slide, please. So the, uh, this is an, ex uh, again, this is an example of a, a program that a part-time student might, uh, might go through. You can see this student is, is taking two courses a term. And if that was the case and the student's successful in all her, his courses, uh, they would expect to, to finish up in two years, starting with the seminar that I mentioned uh, and finishing with the two advanced courses, which collectively uh, are, are a student's capstone experience. So applying uh, the learning that they have done um, and then thinking about what they might like to do afterwards and putting that into some sort of a culminating project in the last term. Next slide, please. I think I'm done. All right, thank you, Dr. Diamond. So we're going to continue by going over the application requirements. Applicants must submit a complete application, which can be found on our website. The application fee is $80. We also need official transcripts, including institutions you may have taken courses but did not receive a degree. Again, this is from all post-secondary institutions that you have attended. Next, a 500-word essay must be uploaded. Please visit our website on the admissions webpage to learn more about the essay portion of the application. You will also need a current resume or CV, two letters of recommendation. So we do prefer at least one of your references to be an academic reference from a former instructor or faculty. However, if you are unable to have one academic letter of recommendation, we are able to accept two professional letters of recommendation. And lastly, the GRE is not required for this program. There are a few additional steps you need to take in order to complete the application process if you're an international student. You must submit a TOEFL or IELTS score. And if your degree was completed outside of the US, you will need to complete a course-by-course -course evaluation. Additional information can be found on our website. The tuition for the 2021-2022 academic school year is $944 per credit for online classes and a $20 per credit technology fee. Please keep in mind this excludes textbook, course materials, graduation fee, and registration fee. Additional fees apply and are charged separately from tuition. We encourage you to view our tuition and fees page on our website for the most up-to-date information about tuition and fees. And if you're interested in applying for financial aid, we strongly encourage you to apply for financial aid when you start your application. Also, the School of Education offers a very limited number of partial need-based institutional scholarships each year. The SOE's endowed scholarship awards range on average from 500 to 1,500 per semester, and it is applied to tuition expenses beginning in the fall semester. 
Please keep in mind, in order to apply for the SOE endowed scholarship, students must complete the FAFSA form. To learn more if you qualify to apply for the endowed scholarship or have any questions relating to financial aid, please visit our website. Thank you for attending the Daylit virtual webinar. At this time, we would like to open up the floor for questions. And Dr. Diamond, uh, while we wait for questions in the chat box, there are some frequently asked questions that we get here in the Office of Admissions about the Daylit uh, program. Uh, first is, what is the delivery format of the program? I know you discussed this. We had some people who came in uh, online late. Sure. So the uh, courses are, will vary from it, it will vary from course to course. The the assumption is asynchronous, right? So it's an asynchronous online program. So the course is designed for uh, students who will and and faculty who will not be in the same place at the same time. Um, that said, all of your courses will involve some level of uh, of uh, of synchronous learning. So. Um, you could expect to spend a lot of your time through the learning management system, um, uh, doing your readings, engaging with classmates, um, uh, submitting your materials, looking at videos, going outside of the learning management system uh, to look at other resources. Uh, other times you can imagine coming into uh, Zoom sessions for something like a lecture uh, or something like a brief lecture um, and, and group work or individual work, depending on what the faculty member is, is doing. Um, on average, you would, could probably expect to see three to four synchronous sessions per semester. Um, sometimes uh, faculty will do considerably more than that. Um, you'll never be required to go uh, to those that are always recorded. Um, you, would be, you would be strongly encouraged uh, to attend those synchronous sessions. Thank you, Dr. Diamond. And the, the next question is for someone who has maybe never have taken an online course. So what does collaborative learning look like in a virtual setting? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, well, it looks like a lot of things. I, it, it, uh, at one level, it looks like this. It looks like us talking, uh, or in this case, me talking at you, uh, but ideally uh, a group of us talking with each other uh, in a virtual window like this. Uh, really, more interestingly, what it looks like um, is people, uh, students working synchronously using online tools, um, and that is really a range, right? So that could be anything from uh, Google Jamboard to Microsoft Teams uh, to um, any, any number of tools, really, um, and either working together real time uh, working together within uh, some sort of a collaborative space and sharing materials, um, uh, leaving comments for one another, either via video recordings or audio recordings, uh, or doing it real time um, as they're annotating uh, as they're annotating documents uh, or or materials together. Uh, it also often just uh, entails traditional uh, getting together and and meeting, but in a space like this. Right, so so student uh, uh, teams uh, coming together uh, to meet for some amount of time to chat uh, and uh, to divvy up work and to go their own ways and uh, and then come back together and 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 discuss the work. So that that's what a good amount of co online collaboration looks like in in this program. Thanks, Dr. Diamond. Um, just a quick question. This is another frequently asked one. Um, you know, regarding. Um, do you have students who work full time and attend part time? And if so, how many hours um, a week do you anticipate outside of regular lecture um, and interactive activities um, someone working full time would need to devote to studying for the program? So it depends on, thank you for that question. It depends on the course. Um, we typically tell students that between the readings, uh, on a weekly basis uh, between or among the readings, the group work, if they have group work uh, for that session, for whatever their project work is, whatever deliverables they might have um, for a class, they should expect to spend 15 to 20 hours a week on the coursework. 
Great. Thank you so much. Um, in terms of another question that often comes up is, can you share a little bit more information on uh, Daylit's grad certificate in uh, leadership and technology integration? Sure. And can that actually um, be completed? And then um, is there an opportunity to roll, enroll in the master's degree in Daylit uh, following completion of that certificate? Uh, so, um, okay, there's a few questions there. Let me, if, if I forget one of them, um, please remind me. So is it possible to uh, begin life as it were in the certificate and wind up in the degree? Yes, certainly. Um, all of the courses um, that are in the certificate fall under the, the broad umbrella of the program. We do have students um, who start in the certificate um, and wind up um, ultimately pursuing um, the, the full master's degree. There are also um, independent studies. This is where Liz, you would, you'll be able to speak to this better um, than, than I can. Um, we do have an option here in the School of Education where students can combine certificates in different programs. So for example, um, one that is not necessarily uncommon is students um, taking a certificate in mind, brain, and teaching, which is another program uh, in the School of Education, taking the technology leadership certificate and essentially combining those uh, to, to, to create their own master's degree, as it, as it were, um, with a few other programs. That's not the only route by which students can take advantage of other programs in the school, so long as a program is open to taking students from outside um, of the program, our students are eligible to take those courses. Um, up to two, sometimes the possibility of three um, in consultation with your advisor. So it's actually a pretty amazing um, opportunity, right? It's, I, I would say that uh, on the continuum of extremely prescriptive uh, to not quite so prescriptive master's degree programs, um, this program is sort of is, is somewhere in between, so we're pretty prescriptive uh, in terms of um, re requirements, but I, I do think we give a fair amount of play um, for students to explore courses um, in, in other programs, again, in consultation with their advisor, right, so really thinking through what would it mean to take courses in other programs and to integrate them with what you're learning and applying um, in Dalit. Uh, to, to help you move further down the road professionally where you want to be or just or just further down the road intellectually to, to where you want to be. Um, so there are opportunities to, to do that. Um, so, so let's see, in another program, we're asking professors from other tracks to collaborate. So I, I think I answered that question. Is that, did I answer all those questions? Yeah, um, yes, you did. And just to clarify, the um, the um, kind of companion master's degree is the Master of Science and Educational Studies Individual Interdisciplinary Program. That would be the program where you could combine the Red Cert in Leadership and Technology Integration and another certificate to kind of, um, in essence, kind of design your learning goals. Um, and what you want to focus on. Um, and then also today we are largely focused on the master's in digital age learning and educational technology, which is more of an intensive. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Diamond. Um, I did get a question. Uh, it was messaged privately. Um, the person, the student is asking, are you still accepting applications for the fall 2021 semester? We, we are. And I should, <laughs> I'm laughing because I know this date should just this change and the director of admissions is on and, and I should know this date, but I don't have it at the tip of my tongue. But fortunately, we do have the admissions people on and they can. Answer yes, the yes, absolutely. So we are quickly approaching our fall semester start on August 30th. So the last date to actually fully submit the online form for a fall 2021 application is August 10th. And the last date that Dr. Diamond has agreed to review a com uh, completed application, that means that all your transcripts and your letters of recommendation that Sian talked about earlier um, is going to be the 24th. So it's roughly seven days. So if anyone is interested in getting started this fall, it is a possibility. Um, we are also currently open for our spring 
2022. We're accepting applications for that term as well. And um, Daylit does accept uh, admissions applications for summer. So um, you have many opportunities, but I would encourage anyone who is interested in getting started right away, please contact us after today. We'll leave our, our information um, up in the last slide. And I just had one other question come in privately. Dr. Diamond, I have, if I am not a certified K through 12 teacher, can I still be admitted into and benefit from the MS Dalit program? Oh, certainly. Yes, so, so thank you for that question. Um, yes, and, and you will be in good company. So as I say, the majority of our students are K-12 teachers, but we are not exclusively um, a K-12 program. Um, we have any number of people who are in other professional contexts. Um, and I would say that another advantage of this program is that when you have um, students from these different professional backgrounds coming together, so people in the K-12 space, people in the broad adult education space um, with different jobs, different trajectories, different interests, um, it's extremely beneficial. And, and this is something that we hear from our students regularly um, at, at the end of courses, particularly the, the courses that are very project oriented, right? So where students um, spend a significant amount of time um, conceptualizing some sort of a product, right? That's, um, that is based on their readings, based on their thinking. Um, but then that is drawing uh, from the experiences, drawing from the competencies and skill sets uh, of people from, from very different areas. Um, students find it to be very, very advantageous. Um, so yes, uh, you do not need to be uh, K-12 certified um, in order to, to come into the program. Or no, you do not need to be certified. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Diamond. And this slide right here has some important contact information. Um, any admissions related questions, please reach out to my colleague, Tyrene. Uh, her email phone number is here. Um, and also for program related questions, um, we have Lisa McNeil, Senior Academic Program Coordinator. And then of course, Jim, uh, Dr. Diamond is always available to talk to uh, students as well. It looks like there are no more questions. Thank you so much for your interest in the Johns Hopkins School of Education. Thank you, Dr. Diamond, for a wonderful presentation. We look forward to hearing from everyone. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Bye-bye, everyone. Mm -hmm.